Um, I just wanted to make a little, uh, a few comments about what's been going on with our public libraries this year and why I think uh, out of many years, Banned Books Week is so special this year. I think as many of you are aware, there have been a couple of hot topics in library land this year, uh, the first of which is internet filtering. And you may know that the Supreme Court upheld federal legislation that requires public libraries to install internet filters if they want to receive uh, federal subsidies for communication costs. So that was a difficult decision, one that I think was not unexpected by the Supreme Court, particularly given the makeup of the court. But uh, how does that affect us here in San Francisco? Uh, San Francisco provides unfiltered internet access. We're very proactive in the way we provide that. We have focused websites for children, teens, adults, all kinds of subject web websites, but our library commission has um, not considered filtering and we're not anticipating doing that. Now just a little bit of history for those of you who may not be familiar. When uh, the internet filtering bill called the Children's Internet Protection Act, SEPA, when that was first passed uh, by uh, the feds about two years ago, uh, at that time, Supervisor Mark Leno was very, very concerned about that issue, and he sponsored legislation that ultimately was adopted by the Board of Supervisors that prohibited us from filtering adult or teen computers. So even if uh, under some reason in the world we had considered that, we couldn't do that here in San Francisco, and I think that's a good statement on the part of the Board of Supervisors about their determination that filters are really inadequate and they want the citizens here to be provided with full access to information. So even though by not uh, installing the filters we are losing some, some of our federal subsidy, we feel that that's an important way to move forward. So in a way we think that this Banned Books Week celebration also celebrates the fact that we are continuing to provide all of you with unfiltered access to the internet. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Now, another hot topic this year, uh, and I think uh, libraries have really had a year of quite a bit of visibil visibility, is the USA Patriot Act. Now, the Patriot Act, yeah, that's right. Some of you may have um, been with us when we had a great, several months ago, we had a great town hall meeting here with Representative Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont, who has sponsored legislation to uh, revise the Patriot Act and. Uh, take out the sections that pertain to libraries and bookstores. And uh, since we were with uh, Representative Sanders several months ago, he's really made a lot of progress in that vein. And it's very interesting, many of his independent, liberal, progressive caucus, of course, is backing him, but also the extremely conservative elements of the Republican Party and other conservative folks who really don't want anybody involved in their business at all are coming together to support this issue. So we strongly hope that we will see some legislation revising the Patriot Act uh, coming out of Washington. And of course, the Library Commission here and the Board of Supervisors has taken a firm stand against the Patriot Act. And in a way, the Patriot Act is the opposite of Banned Books Week. We want to keep your information in regard to what you read and what you look at in the internet sites you visit at the library to be completely private. That's really your business um, and nobody else's. And of course, the Patriot Act would allow the FBI to come in virtually on very, very limited evidence and obtain all those records. So something that we've done here at the library to be as proactive as possible is we have done something that we call uh, a privacy audit. And we re have reviewed all our records. And you know we have to keep records, of course, for business purposes and to track who has what book out and to get overdue notices sent, but we are keeping as little information as possible, only what we need to just keep our library business here going from day to day, because we feel strongly that if we don't have a record when we're asked for it, we can't provide it. So that's the approach we're taking. <laughs> <clears throat> And you know, I think many people have lots of questions about the internet and you know, I think of course we, we saw at 9-11 that in fact some of the individuals involved in that 
had been using the internet in Florida in a public library and were identified as such by the librarian. And in that case, um, the librarian, of course, didn't turn over any records, but she did talk with the authorities and eventually they did assist in that matter. And of course, the library assists if we think there's any kind of a situation where someone is um, you know, participating in illegal acts. And that does sometimes happen here. But generally, uh, when you're using the internet here with our system that we adopted about a year ago where you sign on the internet yourself in an, with an online system, when you're done with your session here, the memory of the internet as to what sites you visited is completely wiped out. So we really couldn't provide that information to the authorities if they needed it. And you know, I think books are very important as to what people are thinking and doing, but often the FBI seems to target the internet. So we're doing the best we can to protect your privacy, and we think that's a very important element in Banned Books Week because we're here to protect you, your rights as a reader, and your right to read whatever you want to read. And that's what Banned Books, Books Week is all about. So we appreciate your coming tonight. Um, the handout that we have, the program, is really interesting, and there's some highlighted books on there that have been banned over the years. It's amazing to see those titles. I pulled up a list of the 100 most frequently challenged books of 1990, uh, uh, since 1990. This is from the American Library Association on their website. And just a couple of the titles that are amazing to me. Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. In the Night Kitchen by Maurice Sendak, which is just a lovely children's book, which I read to my children many times. The Stupids by Harry Allard, which is just really the funniest kids' book series I've ever known. Um, it's really great. To Kill a Mockingbird, I think most everyone knows that has been banned, and it, it may be in the class of the selection I'm going to be reading from uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Some of these classics that represent a time in America that we may not think is politically correct, but still it was a time that we all experienced. Flowers for Algernon is another one. Harry Potter. Now, we find a number of books uh, are People are concerned about them because they seem to relate to witchcraft and demonology and that kind of thing. But boy, when you look at what Harry Potter has done for reading in America, all ages are reading Harry Potter. So I just, you know, it's a great book and it's hard for me to imagine it's on the list. Finally, just a couple. I don't know what, the, what this one is about. I can't imagine. Mommy laid an egg. <laughs> so I don't know what the story was. And the last one, I, I, some of you who may have young children might be familiar with this. Where's Waldo? I cannot imagine what is up with Where's Waldo, where you're trying to find Waldo in the, in the poster, but anyway. Well, I, <clears throat> I chose to read from The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn because it's just amazing to me that this, this classic, classic book um, could really be considered to be banned uh, and has been suggested to be banned in some jurisdictions. And I, I should just mention that I've been working here at the San Francisco Public Library for five years. We've had a history of almost over 123, 24 years. I'm sure we have had challenge books, but we haven't had one recently. Uh, and we do have a process in place to re-examine a book if it is challenged, but I think our community is quite tolerant and we don't normally see a lot of challenges. But in some communities, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was problematic, and I think it's because of a couple factors in just scanning through, I read this book many years ago, and I scanned through it recently preparing for this discussion. Um, of course, we see a depiction of life in America when slavery was a completely accepted situation. And I think that may have been grounds for concern. And also, of course, the language in here is very colloquial, and the N-word is used in this book, and in fact, I think I might touch on it in one of my selections I'm going to be reading. But um, I think that's the reason, and I just thought I'd highlight a couple of passages that I think someone might have been concerned about. Now, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Initially, um, there was a rumor, of course, at the beginning of the book that the young gentleman, Huck, the kind of rafish young guy, had been killed, although that wasn't true, and the slave uh, on the, on, in the home that he was staying with and had um, friendships with, Jim, had run off. So let me just give you a little bit of that story. And this is from Jim's point of view. Well, you see, it is this way. Oh, missus, that's Miss Watson, she pecks on me all the time and treats me pooty rough, but she always said she wouldn't sell me down to Orleans. But I noticed there was a nigger trader around the place considerable lately, and I began to get uneasy. 
Well, one night I creeps to de pooty late, and de, de, de weren't quite shit, and I hear old missus tell de widder she gwine to sell me to Orleans. And she didn't want to, but she could get $800 for me. And it is such a big stack of money she couldn't resist. De widder, she tried to get her to say she wouldn't do it, but I never waited to hear the rest. I lit out mighty quick, I tell you. I took out in Shindown to Hill and spec to steal a skift long to shore, summers above the town, but day was people astern yet, so I hid in the old tumble down cooper shop on the bank to wait for everybody to go away. Well, I was there all night. Day was somebody round all the time. Long about six in the morning, skiffs begin to go by, all about eight or nine every skift that went long was talking about how yo pap came over to the town and say you's killed. These last skiffs was full of ladies and gentlemen and going over for to see the place. Sometimes they'd pull up at the show and take a rest before they start across, so by the talk I got to know all about the killing. I was pal for sorry you killed Huck, but I ain't no more now. I laid there under the shavings all day. I was hungry, but I weren't feared, because I knowed old missus and de widder was going to start to the camp meeting right out of breakfast. So be gone all day, and dey knows I goes off with the cattle about daylight so they wouldn't speck to see me round a place, and so they wouldn't miss me till arter dark in the evening. De other servants wouldn't miss me, because they'd shin out take holiday soon as the old folks was out in the way. Well, when it came dark, I took up the river road and went about two mile or more to where they weren't no houses. I made up my mind about what I was going to do. You see, if I keep on trying to get away afoot, the dogs would track me. If I stole a skiff to cross over, they'd miss that skiff, you see, and they'd know about where I'd to land on the other side and what to pick up my track. So I says, a raft is what I order. It's going to make no tracks. I see a lighter coming round to point by me, so I wade in and shove a log ahead of me and swim more than halfway across the river and get in monks to driftwood and keep my head down low and can just swim again to current till the raft come along. Then I swum to stern of it and I took a hold of it. It clouded up and was pretty dark for a little while, so I clumb up and laid down onto planks. The ma'am was all way yonder in the middle was the lantern was. The river was a-rising and day was a good current, so I reckoned at before in the morning I'd be 25 miles down the river and then I'd slip in just before daylight and swim ashore, even take to the woods on the Illinois side. But I didn't have no luck. When we is mowed down to head at the island, a man began to come aft with the lantern. I see it weren't no use for to wait, so I slid overboard and struck out for the island. Well, I had a notion I could land mows anywheres, but I couldn't. Bank to bluff. I was mows to their foot and the island before I got a good place. I went into the woods and judged I wouldn't fool with rafts no more, long as they moved the lantern round so. I had my pipe and a plug and dog leg and some matches in my cap and they weren't wet so I was all right. So then they went on to have many, many adventures as you know and of course he, uh, Jim became aware that, that Huck wasn't dead and that was a big story. But the friendship between Huck and Jim was really amazing and I think that reality of a friendship between a young white boy and a slave was something that was very foreign to people at the time and might have been one of the concerns with this, with this book. But I really think it, it shows the friendship between these two was really amazing. And I'm just going to read one other portion um, because <clears throat> as they developed the friendship, Hook in a way was trying to educate Jim about uh, the history of life that, that Huck was aware of. And of course, Huck wasn't as educated as his friend Tom, Tom Sawyer, who came along later. And the other thing that was interesting in this relationship between Huck and Jim was that uh, at the time, it was very improper for Huck to be assisting a slave in any kind of a situation of getting away. So Huck was very worried about that, but ultimately I think he realized that friendship was more important than what society might have thought. But Huck was telling, uh, <clears throat> Jim about um, history of kings and dukes and other things like that. And this is how that conversation uh, went. Yes, says I, who was Huck, and other times when things is dull, they fuss with the parliament. And if everybody don't go just so, he whacks their heads off, but mostly they hang around the harem. Round a witch? The harem. What's the harem? The place where he keeps his wives. Don't you know about the harem? Solomon had one. He had about a million wives. Why, yes, dat's so. I done forgot it. A harem's a boarding house, I reckon. Most likely, they has rackety times in the nursery. And I reckon de wives quarrels considerable, and that, crease, and that increase de racket. 
Yet they say Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. I don't take no stock in that. Because why? Would a wise man want to live in the midst of such a bim blamming all the time? No, deed he wouldn't. A wise man had taken Bill a biller factory, and then he could shut down the biller factory when he want to rest. Well, but he was the wisest man anyway, because the widow, she told me so her own self, Huck said. I don't care what the widow say. He warn't no wise man nother. He had summer dad fetishes ways I ever see. Does you know about that child that he's gone to chop in two? Yes, the widow told me all about that. Well, then, warn't that the beatenest notion in the world? You just take and look at it a minute. Da's the stump. Da, that's one or the woman. Hey, you, that's the other one. Oz Solomon, and dish your dollar bills to child. Biff you and claims it. What does I do? Does I shin around amongst the neighbors and find out which one do you belong to and hand it over to the right one, all safe and sound? Do what to anybody dad had any gumption would do? No, I take and whack the bill in two and give half on it to you and the other half to the other woman. That's the way Solomon was going to do with the child. Now I want to ask you, what's the use of that half a bill? Can't buy nothing with it? And what is use of half a child? I wouldn't give a dern for a million of them. But hang it, Jim, you miss, you clean missed the point. Blame it, you missed it a thousand miles. Who, me? Go along. Don't talk to me about yo points. I reckon I know sense what I sees it, and they ain't no sense in such doings as dat. Dispute will not about half a child, dispute was about a whole child. And the man that think he can settle a dispute about a whole child with half a child don't know enough to come in out of the rain. Don't talk to me about Solomon Huck. I knows him by the back. Well, I tell you, you don't get the point. Blame the point. I reckon I knows what I knows, and mind you, the real point is down further. It's down deeper. It lays in the way Solomon was raised. You take a man that's got only one or two chillin', it's that man going to be wasteful of chillin'? No, he ain't. He can't afford it. He knows how to value them. But you take a man that's got about five million chillin' run around a house, and it's different. He as soon chop a chillin' <laughs> child in two as a cat. There's plenty more. A child or two, more or less, won't know can second Consequence to Solomon, that fetch him. And Huck says, I never see such a nigger. If he got a notion in his head once, there weren't no getting it out again. He was the most down on Solomon of any, of any nigger I'd ever see. So I went to talking about other kings, and I let Solomon slide. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see they had a unique relationship. Thank you very much. <laughs>